In today's video, we're going to look at the intersection between planes. Specifically, we're looking at planes in R3, and I've drawn two schematics here. One of them, there's no intersection of the planes, and the other one, we have a line of intersection of two planes. So when you have the schematic on the left, when there's no intersection, you can see that these planes run to infinity in every direction. Um, and there's clearly no intersection because they're completely parallel to each other, right? So if you were to try to figure this out, if there's any intersection, you would try to solve a system of solutions and you'd be finding that there's no solutions whatsoever. So that would be an indication that the planes are parallel to each other. You could also figure this out by checking to see if the normal vector between two planes, if both of the, both of the normal vectors, if they're parallel to each other, then that's another way to find out that the planes would also be parallel. If you're unsure, let's solve a system of equations and then we can interpret our result. And then most likely on a question that's going to be worth like a decent amount of marks, there will be some line of intersection just because there's, a lot, uh, there's more work that you can do. So let's say that we're given two planes, two scalar equations of planes and it's given by 2x plus 8y plus 2z equals 3. So this is equation number 1 for one plane. And another, we've got x minus 4y plus 6z equals 3. This will be a second equation of a plane. And again, this is clearly uh, in R3. We've got three variables here. Our dimensions in R3 are x, y, and z. So in order to find the, the solutions of the intersection, well, same way if you had like a quadratic, you know, if you had two or, or just two functions, if you want to find out where the intersection is, we need to solve a system of equations of those two functions by equating them and solving that system, right? So similarly, if you have two equations, three unknowns, we're just solving a linear system of equations, right? So the easiest way to do that, I would say, with this, with this many variables and two equations is just solving a matrix. So we could put this into a matrix, 2, 8, 2, and then the homogeneous side would be 3, and then, oh, x, what am I saying? This should be 1, minus 4, 6, 3, and then we're going to row reduce this, right? So we can fairly simply row reduce this. Uh, so let's do... First of all, let's divide row 1 by 2 because we want that leading entry in the top left to be a 1. So immediately let's make that 1, 4, 1, and 3 over 2. 1, negative 4, 6, 3. Our second row remains unchanged. Let's scroll down a bit. Okay. Next. We want a zero to be in the bottom left entry, right? Underneath our leading entry. So we can do row two minus row one. So one minus one would be zero. Negative four minus four would be minus eight. Six minus one is five. And three minus 1.5 is gonna be three over two or 1.5, and our first row remains unchanged. Okay, next. Well, we now, we have our, that first column is looking good, but we want the second column, we need a leading entry to be where that negative eight should be. So to turn that into a one, we can pretty easily divide row two by negative eight. And that'll result in 0, 1, minus 5 eighths. And this will now be minus 3 over 16. 
and our first row becomes unchanged. One, four, one, three over two, and we're, we're getting close. So this is now in REF, right? Row echelon form. You could write down your new equations, right? Because we've reduced that second column or sorry, the second row, we've reduced it by one variable. So it's going to be easier to solve this if you were to rewrite out your equations um, and solve using like put plugging equation two into equation one. Uh, it's totally possible to do it that way. It would be a little bit extra work. But what we can do is turn this into reduced row echelon form. It's just going to make our work a little bit easier, right? So let's do that. Okay. Next, oh, it's an ugly arrow. Let's do that again. Okay. So we can do, well, we're trying to get rid of the four above the, above the second leading entry, right? We're trying to get rid of this four right here. And to do that, we could do uh, row one minus four times row two, right? So row one minus four times row two. So row one, that's one minus zero. This will be a zero, zero, one. And our next entries are going to be a little bit uglier, but it's going to end up in seven over two and nine fourths, negative five eighths, negative three sixteenths. And now we're finally in reduced row echelon form. Okay. And you can see now this is a lot easier to write out our system of equation or the solutions to our equation, right? And this, this totally checks out, right? We've got one free variable, right? And in this column, you can see there's no there's no leading entry, right? So we've got a free variable here. Totally checks out. We should have one because we had three unknowns and we had two equations. So we need to have one free variable, right? It's impossible to have a, a unique solution here. So let's write out, well, we know that this is our, our Z column, right? Oh. So our equations are going to be from row one, we get one X plus 7 over 2z is equal to 9 fourths. And from the second row, we get y minus 5 eighths z is equal to minus 3 sixteenths. Right? We're, we're reading this directly off of our matrix here from reduced row echelon form. Because our first column is x, our second column is y, our third column is z, and then that vertical line is just that imaginary line, and it's kind of representing our equal sign, right? So we're just reading off the rows and turning it back into our uh, like a, a similar system of equations. Great. So now that we've got this, okay. Well, we also know that z is a free variable, so we're gonna write. Let's let z be equal to t, where t is any any real number. And this is mostly just convention. t is often uh, the variable that we use to uh, set as a parameter rather than z. So we're just going to change it to t. So, OK. You might be stuck here thinking, OK, well, I solved this, but like, how is this? A, and how is this? An intersection, right? So let's look back at what we're looking at here. We found a solution, right? Or it looks like there is some solutions that exist. And it's going to look something like a line, right? Because they're planes, they extend infinitely. So we should have infinite solutions that are represented by some line, right? So the best way to represent our answer would actually just be a vector equation of a line. So Let's start by writing out a vector equation of a line, right? 
x, y, z would be equal to, well, okay, what is x? Okay, well, we can rearrange for x right here. We have 9 fourths minus 7 over 2z, right? From right here. So we can say x would be equal to 9 fourths minus 7 over 2z, right? I'm just replacing the x entirely, right? Y, similarly, we could do minus 3 over 16, and then we can move the 5 eighths z to the other side, plus 5 eighths z, right? And z remains unchanged, okay? And now you can see here, we can actually break this up. So we've got this first vector here, could be 9 fourths minus 3 over 16, 0, plus, and let's change this to a t now. Well, from our first equation, we would get minus 7 over 2. We would get 5 eighths. And then in our last one, well, remember, this, there, there's this little 1z here, right? It would be it would be the same as 0 plus 1z. So 0 plus 1t, or 1z. So we're going to have a 1 here. And that's about it, right? So you can see here that this is our final answer right here for the equation of the line that represents the intersection of these two planes that we were given, right? And it would look something like this. I mean, of course, these ones are, they look pretty perpendicular to each other, but it could look something, uh, it could look slightly different. But yeah, hope this video was helpful, and uh, yeah, leave a comment. Thanks.